This episode goes out to Crystal in Los Angeles. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the 16th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 2. It's a special deal day, listener. Today, in America and the UK, you can get a Kindle copy of Nightblade for only 99 cents. Or 99 pence in the UK, I guess. It, it's pence, right? Pence is a thing? We're gonna say it's a thing. The point is, you can get the first book in the Nightblade Epic for just a buck. If you've been enjoying the podcast all this time, picking up the book while it's on sale is a great way to show your support. And hey, if you already own Nightblade, consider picking up a copy for a friend. Or for a bunch of friends. I'm not going to judge you. Except to judge you as awesome. Pick up your Kindle copy of Nightblade today for just a buck on Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting Chapter 21 of Mystic. When we left off, Lauren and her friends had just set out into the city of Wellmont, intending to steal enough gold to bribe their way out of the city. Enjoy! Mystic, Chapter 21 They returned to the trade quarter. Despite what Lauren had said at the inn, it pained her to think of robbing such simple folk. But she consoled herself that such craftsmen would be living fat now, fed by the desperation of a fearful city, and might do so for many days to come. They reached the great square at the center of the quarter. Hundreds of paces wide it was, and with a great statue of an armored man in the center. His head was bare, and he held a sword aloft. Just at the statue's feet, a wagon sagged to the side. Moving through the press of people, she saw why. The wagon had lost a wheel, and now the horses could not pull it. The owner, a large beast of a man with hair all over his face and arms, tried to lift the wagon where the wheel had come loose, while a boy tried to fit the wheel back to its housing. The wagon held scraps of lumber, but they were only dregs. Its cargo had been sold already. The woodsman's cries of anger went unheeded by the crowd swirling around. "'This looks promising,' said Lauren. "'Come, let us see more.' They drew closer still, and just as they approached, the woodsman dropped the wagon and straightened with a cry of anger, turning on the boy beside him. "'You useless whelp! If you do not get that wheel on, you will regret it!' "'The cart is not high enough, duh,' said the boy." He was skinny and pale and hardly looked to be the son of a woodsman. I cannot get it on unless it is higher. Dock back, will you? And the woodsman lashed out with a punishing slap across the boy's face. Her qualms fled. With boiling blood, Lauren murmured to Zane and Jem, Yes, this will do wonderfully. What do you mean to do? said Zane. Never you mind, said Lauren. Only remain silent. Your tongue is as smooth as a sandy river bank. Jem, watch for the purse and take it as soon as you may. I will, said Jem. From the tone of his voice, Lauren did not imagine he held any more love for the woodsman than she. Ho, oh, friend, said Lauren amiably. You look to be in a fix. The lumberjack turned to her, scowling. What is it to you? Be off, beggar. Lauren gave her cloak a little flourish, and she saw the lumberjack's eyes flick to its fine black cloth. No beggars here, friend, only a passing maiden who sees a stranded carpenter. She saw the woodsman's chest puff out slightly. As a woodsman's daughter, Lauren knew well that carpenters were highly regarded by the laborers who supplied them. Only a simple woodsman, my lady, said the man with a leer, though bless your sweet tongue. A woodsman, truly, said Lauren, feigning delight, though she wanted to slap him. I was a woodsman's daughter until my father came into fortune. He fought for the king and earned himself a title. He is a fool who got lucky then, the woodsman grinned. 
Fighting wars is no business for a man who likes living, though I am pleased to hear a fellow workman profited from it. Lauren kept her smile bright. Indeed. But I cannot let a fellow craftsman suffer so. Come, cousins, let us help with their wagon. Not that one, said the woodsman, pointing at Jem. I will not have him getting hurt on my account. Look at the little waif. He cannot have eaten in days. He is of that age, said Lauren. Three lunches have filled those legs today with room to spare. That is a sign of health, said the woodsman. I wish my son were the same. He cuffed the boy beside him once more, eliciting a yelp. Lauren's heart broke. The boy could not be a year older than Jem. There is time yet, she said. Come then, cousin. Zane looked at her with a blank expression until Lauren seized his arm and pulled him to the wagon. Jem stood back, eyes darting everywhere, waiting. Together they lifted, and as the wagon rose, the woodsman's son fitted the wheel to the spoke. Then the woodsman cut himself a new spar to stick through the hole in the axle, and the wheel was fixed. Many thanks, said the woodsman. I hope you expect no pay from a simple man such as myself. I would never dream of it, said Lauren. Payment spoils the virtue of the deed. As I have always said, though that does not stop us from taking a good coin or two from those who need our wares, eh? He laughed loud and long as though sharing a secret joke. Lauren joined the laugh, hating the man more with every moment. Right you are. I imagine things must be quite well for you here, with the city worried about the Dorsians. Arrows, fortifications, even stocks for deserters. The woodsman glanced around and, seeing no one else near, reached into a hidden compartment in his wagon. When his hand re-emerged, it held a purse bigger than his fist, filled almost to bursting. Just look at the measure of their need. Mayhap I can buy myself a title like your father and never need wield a sword to earn it. Over the man's shoulder, Lauren saw Jem perk up. My wishes are with you, my friend, she said. But hide that quickly. They say this city has more thieves than cobblestones, and never more so than now. I do not doubt it, said the woodsman, stowing the purse again. Oi, Gillum, get yourself on the wagon quick. We are off. His son scrambled to obey. I wish you safe travels under the sky, said Lauren. Yourself as well, and may your road soon take you away from this place. The woodsman extended a hand. If ever you travel along the Great Rocks, look for my village. It is two days' ride north of here. Gillum is my name, as it is my son's. We shall put you up and feed you well, though I am sure you would find our fare meager. Lauren was taken aback for a moment, but she swiftly recovered and took his wrist. Thank you, Gillum. I am... I am Damaris. May we meet again. Gillum gave her wrist a firm shake and went to the back of his wagon to ready it for travel. From the corner of her eye, Lauren saw Jem wave the coin purse behind the man's back. But she had one thing to do before they could leave. Quick and silent as a fox, she stole to the front of the cart. The boy Gillum looked down at her as she approached, still nursing a welt on his face. Boy, she whispered, come with us. He blinked. What? Zane had followed Lauren and now he seized her shoulder. What are you doing? He whispered. She shook him off. There is no need to stay with a father who beats you. I ran from home. You can too. Come with us, but quick, now. You are a fool, girl, said Zane, trying to pull her away. Little Gillum drew back from her in fear. Who are you? Get away from me. Lauren balked. I saw him hit you. No parent should treat a child so. Come with me, and you can find a better life. She took the boy's hand, but he yanked it from her grasp. Duh, cried the boy, sliding away on the wagon seat. Da! Help! 
The woodsman appeared like a ghost, his face an ugly scowl. Stop yammering, boy. We are ready. Duh, she wants to take me away, cried the boy Gillum, thrusting an accusing finger at Lauren. The woodsman paused a moment in confusion and then rounded on her. What is this? he said, his voice suddenly low and dangerous. Lauren gulped. The boy is mad, she said. I know not what he speaks of. She said she would take me away, said little Gillum. I do not want to go, da. It seemed the right time to escape, but before she could move, Lauren found Gillum's iron grip upon her. What is this, then? You try to take my son away from me? His other hand swept up to strike her, but Zane caught his arm. That would be a mistake, friend. Gillum released Lauren and gave Zane a great shove with one hand, at the same time catching his wrist. Zane fell to the ground and the woodsman twisted his arm cruelly, drawing a cry of pain. Constables! roared Gillum. Constables! They must have been close, for a man and a woman in red leather appeared in an instant. Who calls for the king's law? said the woman. These ones tried to take my boy. Gillum pointed a meaty finger at Lauren. Them and their little... Where is the child? Gillum spun, searching for Jem. Meanwhile, the constables looked at Lauren and Zane, brows raised in confusion. This man is spinning a tale, Lauren said. I am Damaris of the family Yaren, and I can assure you I... She tried to take me away cried little Gillum from the wagon. There was a third one, said Gillum loudly. He must have... Wait. His eyes squinted like a pig's. Releasing Zane, he ran to the wagon's side and stooped beside it. A moment later, he rose with a roar of pure hatred. My coin! They have taken all my coin! Everything I had! He stumped around the wagon, approaching Lauren with his fists raised high but one of the constables stepped forwards to cut him off while the other constable stepped up to seize Lauren's arm. "'Where is that little whelp of yours?' cried Gillum, trying to push past the constable, but even he was not so foolish as to strike the king's law. "'More thieves than cobblestones indeed! Where is my purse?' "'We do not know what he is saying,' said Zane, finding his feet. "'He attacked us in madness after we helped him with his wagon wheel.' Woodsmen may be coarse, but they are not often mad, said the constable who held Lauren's arm. She looked searchingly into Lauren's green eyes. You say you are of the family Yaren? I have seen more than a few of them, and you do not share their look. She is a thief, spat Gillum. She has my coin. I have nothing, said Lauren. You may search me if you wish. We will, and more besides said the constable. This mess needs sorting. There is nothing to sort. She has robbed me. We shall have the truth of it soon, said the constable. You will come with us. Bring the boy. Zane stepped up, and Lauren saw a terrible look in his eyes. But before he could whisper a word of power, Lauren cried out, No! The wizard stopped, a hand held out before him. No, Zane. Lauren said, more quietly, It is all right. We will go with them. This shall all be sorted out. After all, we hold no stolen goods, do we? She looked at him, trying to impart her meaning. Jem was gone. Without the urchin and the coins he carried, Gillum had no case against them. Zane may have taken the point, or else he merely trusted her. In any case, he relaxed, giving Lauren a slow nod. This is madness, bellowed Gillum. I have been robbed, and you lot mean to ask me questions? You will come to answer them or spend the night in a cell, said the constable. Which shall it be, woodsman? Gillum fumed. He grimaced and growled and ground his teeth, but he had little choice. His boy climbed down off the cart, and the constables led them all out of the market pushing through the curious crowd that had formed around them. "'Let it be known, girl,' said Gillum beside her. 
I will see you face the king's justice for this. They take a finger for every stolen penny in Wellmont. Then they pull teeth. You will be a cripple by the time they are done with you. That is enough, said one of the constables, pushing Gillum along, and not gently. Lauren's mind raced. Without Jem, the woodsmen seemed to have little claim upon them. But what if someone recognized Lauren and Zane from their earlier search for work? What if it was discovered which inn they stayed at? The constables would go there and they would find Jem, presumably with all of Gillum's coin. She knew she must think of something and quickly. They came to a tall, wide building with a yard bordered by a wooden fence. Within the gate, Lauren saw constables at drill with blunted swords. Their cries rang out in the muggy afternoon, and each clash of steel on steel made her flinch. Behind them, a wooden gate closed with an ominous click. "'Well, this bodes excellently,' said Zane. The station's front door opened, and the constables led them inside. The lower floor held a large common room like the constable's station in Cabras, with a desk where a clerk waited to record their names. But there, too, were many wide tables for officers to eat at and talk around. At one of those tables sat a constable with gold trim on his armor. He sat in council with many figures in red cloaks and hoods. One of the figures looked up at them and froze. Then he stood, casting off his hood to reveal silvery hair and piercing, pale blue eyes. Jordel. Lauren felt Zane stiffen beside her at the same time her own blood ran cold. And then beside Jordel another figure stood, smaller, slighter, with pale skin and dark eyes. And next to Jordel's expression of perplexed wonder, Vivian's hungry smile turned Lauren's heart to ice. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R.com. Today's letter is R. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>